Guys, let me pray for us. God, I thank you that upon us a light has shined, that we couldn't find it, that we were in darkness and unable to help ourselves. Would you help us this week to see the significance of what it means that the light that we needed came from elsewhere, not from among us or within us or around us, but from you. God, thank you for dawning that light on us, uh, for drawing us to yourself, for making us new and for giving us hope even as we walk in darkness sometimes, that, that there is a light, uh, and that light is beginning to shine because of you, Jesus, coming to earth, being among us and being one of us. Would you help us to trust in that and to trust in you and nothing else? It's in your name we pray. Amen. Um. Few things. We do have a meeting after the service today. I would love it if you would stay right after the service. We're going to have like a kids thing. So, kids, you'll probably hear a song that you're familiar with. You can come on down front. Jim will be up here to, to lead us in that. And then we're going to hear an update from our partnership in Ethiopia, which we haven't talked about in a while. And there's a lot going on there. So, thank you, Corey. And, and we're going to talk about who the next crop sort of of elders and deacons will be. Um, so please stick around for that. These two candles, by the way, should have been lit. That's my eyes on me because I don't do organizational stuff very well at all. And isn't that right, Julie? Yeah, she knows. What we normally do for Advent, we have the two, right? Because we've lit two, we've lit two candles already, and today we light a third, which um, I believe is supposed to be about joy. The idea of joy, I like the idea of overall Advent is seen as a time of fasting. We don't think of that, right? Christmas season, we don't think of fasting, do we? How many of us are baking cookies and, you know, right, yeah. Um, but in, in many church traditions, it is a time of fasting because we are longing, right? We're aching for something else. That is that is sort of the point, I know, right? Um, I know that's challenging. But the reality is, Christmas can be a painful time. And I think we all probably know this. Maybe we, in part, want to deny it. Some of us, maybe. Um, it can be full of memories, right? Um, memories that we maybe are trying to recapture or we miss or, uh, you know, we can't quite get what, what it is we want. Maybe even in our, in our wish lists, right? Maybe we can't get everything we want. Who's made a wish list and, you know, oh, I wanted that thing on it and you, you didn't get it. I remember, let's see, who remembers the Sears wish book? Uh-huh. I think if you're maybe, I, I don't know the line exactly. I know they stopped making this thing in 1993. So um, after, if you, you know, if you're born from the mid-80s on, you probably don't know, never, you know, remember. But we, every household in America used to get this catalog in the mail. It's like this thing. It was bigger than our dictionary. I'm not kidding. It, it was huge. And it had everything that Sears sold in this catalog, and we went through it. It was called the Wish Book. Everybody that remembers it knows what the Wish Book is. And, and, and you'd go through it, and you'd kind of circle the stuff, and some household you'd write your name. But I was the youngest and the only boy, so if, you know, I didn't write, need to write my name beside my circles. They knew, right, who it was. And we all did that, and you went through it. It was so much fun to kind of, you, 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 wish, you made your wish list in the Wish Book. And of course, in the pictures, everything was perfect. It was staged, and all the models were beautiful, of course, and the sweaters and the shirts were not wrinkled, and the toys were not broken, and everything was just as it should be, but that's not quite the way it is, and we know that. 
And then again, even this year, maybe you, you, we don't have the Sears wish book anymore. We have Amazon wish lists. Right? And whatever's on your wish list, if we're honest, is not, it's not what you really want for Christmas. Right? You want to be loved. You want to know that you're significant, that you, that you matter. You want your loved ones to be healthy and well and with you. And, and the thing is, whether we're looking at the Wish Book or Amazon or the L.L. Bean catalog or whatever, we all know, right, that those staged images are not reality. Life isn't as perfect as the, the model's lives. And no one knew this better than Sir Isaac Watts. Isaac Watts wrote the hymn, Joy to the World. The Christmas hymn, Joy to the World. We sing it, we'll sing it a little bit. Isaac Watts has been described, he was born in the 1700s, we don't know for sure, as about five feet tall, uh, abnormally large head. Those are not my words. One of his contemporaries said he had an abnormally large head. He was... uh, uh, Often very sickly, from a chi- from, even from childhood, he struggled with, with health issues. Um, after nearly dying before he was 30 from his health stuff, we're not sure what it was he had, he ended up becoming what they called an invalid. He was almost sort of homebound uh, and living with um, a family as a guest in their home for about 36 years. Now, what's interesting, before, before this happened, before he turned... Before he got sick, and he was a pastor for about 10 years, and then he got sick and he couldn't do it anymore, moved in with them. But before that, he, he, he fell in love once with a woman named Elizabeth Singer. Uh, they, they didn't have, you know, Facebook or any other dating apps. This was before that. So they didn't know each other. They began corresponding through, through letters. That's where you write on paper, and you put it in the mail, and it goes somewhere. Uh, and, and they started talking, and she fell in love with him and his mind, and she was just truly captivated by the man, Isaac Watts. So they met, and he asked her to marry him. This is what she said. She, she herself was a poet. This is Elizabeth Singer, who he was in love with and who loved him. After turning him down, said, I only wish I could admire the casket as much as the jewel inside. So in fancy language, she said she's just not physically attracted to him. Isn't that hard? This was his life. This was his story. If he had seen our modern Christmas marketing and our Amazon photos and our Sears wish books, he would have known that that's not real life. He would know that our lives are often spent longing aching, desiring something else, some, some sense of wholeness, right? some, some fulfillment of some deep ache in us. And occasionally, we might get a glimpse of what we truly want. I'm sure he did in those letters with Elizabeth Singer. And I think that's why he actually based the song, Joy to the World, on Psalm 98. I read part of it earlier. I'll read it all. It says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. For He has done marvelous things. His right hand and His holy arm have worked salvation for Him. The Lord has made known His salvation. He has revealed His righteousness in the sight of the nations. He's remembered His steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous songs and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre, with the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, and the world and those who dwell in it, and the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. 
He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. What is the joy? Joy. Shout for joy. Sing for joy. Make a joyful noise. Joy to the world. What is the joy that that both the psalmist and Watts are pointing us toward? I think a few things. First of all, there is joy. There is joy in longing for the promises of God. There's joy in longing for God's promises. When I was a kid, growing up in church, Christmas is surrounded by, you know, nativity scenes and, and Christmas trees and wreaths and that kind of thing. I, I always thought when we sang joy to the world that we were singing about a baby. That we were singing, you know, the, all the images, right? The, the cattle and the, the, the stable and the, uh, y- you know, the wise men who actually wouldn't come till a few years later, Right? <laughs> All this, the the imagery, that that we were looking back at an event and we were singing about joy. That's not what Psalm 98 is doing. It's not looking back. That's not what Watts is doing in Joy to the World. He's not looking back. Now, verse 2 says, He has made known His salvation. And in the manger scene... He kind of has made it known, kind of made it known the way the Sears Wish Book or the Amazon tracking notifications make known the presence, right? It's kind of revealed, but not, not really, not fully. Some of us won't have the Christmas that we wish we could have. Maybe because loved ones are no longer with us. Or because they're incarcerated. Or maybe the last couple of years have been financially difficult. And maybe you just can't afford to have all the presents under the tree that you wish you could. Or maybe, as is actually quite common... Seeing other people's joy and the Christmas spirit and and all the good things is only deepening your sense of depression. That's because the curse is still at work in all of our lives and in the world around us. On that note, Shay, would you put this middle screen down? I see people going blind. (laughs) Thank you. See? We've got this beautiful cross, and for about three months out of the year, it just doesn't work there. You know, my favorite verse in that song, Joy to the World, is, No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground, He comes to make his blessings flow. How far? Far as the curse is found. That baby in that manger is not finished. It's not done yet. And this line, in fact, I'd say the whole song, is a plea, a crying out to the Lord Jesus to finish what he started. He is not finished making known his salvation. Advent, Christmas season, right? It's a time where we often clamor, we we strive, we, we really work hard to achieve some sense of nostalgia or wonder, right? We, we, we put on... A certain, I bet all of us have a certain music, like a certain album that we just got to listen to, right? For me, it's White Christmas by Bing Crosby. Why? Because I grew up with it, right? We, we, we have these things that are a part of the thing, that, and, and we want to accomplish this feeling of wonder or nostalgia, the smell of certain cookies baking, eggnog, right? 
the way you open presents, right? We have these traditions that we want to experience again and again and again. But there is no wonder at all. There's no sense of awe and, and joy, like the sense of longing and aching for something else. We look back. Watts looks forward. You know, our, our stories, our little stories, are often glimpses into the big story, the creation, fall, redemption, and restoration narrative, right? This big story. Our lives are often little glimpses of what that looks like. Each of us, except for maybe the youngest here, and for you I'm terribly sorry, maybe you're not listening, each of us has experienced something that philosophers or psychologists or writers might call a loss of innocence. A moment, perhaps, when we discovered that the world was not what it ought to be. Maybe an older relative said something or looked at you or touched you in a way that shattered everything. Maybe it was a page torn out of a magazine that you found in the trash or a Snapchat post or depending on how old you are, the images come in different forms. Or maybe it was when your favorite toy was broken or destroyed or you were bullied or somebody did something to you on purpose and hurt you, but we all have something that taught us for the first time that the world was dangerous and scary and not right. And from that moment on, you found it harder to trust. And you began to find ways to protect your what you now have discovered, very fragile heart. And maybe, right, maybe by now you've just numbed yourself so much that you no longer even have the ability to yearn and to ache, and to long for that to be restored. But that ache, and that longing, and that hope for restoration, there's actually deep, deep joy in it, if we will let ourselves feel it. Watts wants us to ache with longing for God's promises to be fulfilled. The psalmist wants us to feel the joy of knowing that his salvation is coming. I'll be honest with you guys, I actually wept in my office this week thinking about the yearling. Anybody read the yearling? Uh, It's it's written in 1938. I'm going to totally spoil it. Although, no, I'm not going to totally spoil it, but I I might spoil it a little bit. Written in 1938, uh, it's a story of a young boy and his pet deer who he loses by the end. But it's really a story about the boy losing his innocence. And it's heartbreaking. Andrew Peterson, who we watched Wednesday night, uh, wrote a song about it. It's what I was thinking about. This is what he says. It was good, 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 but now it's gone. I'm a little boy who's lost out in the woods, always looking for the fawn. For that thing that was lost. When we sing, no more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. Let your heart ache for that. Cry out for that. It is vulnerable. It is painful. It is scary. I know this. But that promise, there is joy in that hope. If we're able to feel it. Even as we know that we're lost in the woods and longing for something else. G.K. Chesterton reminds us that fairy tales don't exist to teach us that dragons are real. We already know that, right? But they're there to teach us that dragons can be killed. There's a day coming when the dragons will be killed. And that's good. And we can ache and we can long and we can hope for that day. And that's a part of what we do at Christmas when we're longing and looking forward is knowing, believing and hoping and praying that one day the dragons will die. Another thing that 
worth taking joy in is that God's promises extend into every corner of our lives and our hearts. There's joy in that. Verse 3 of the psalm says, All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Have seen the salvation of our God. Now, this is what we might call, and I might be coining this term, I'll have to consult some books, but, but we could probably call this psalm, an big word, eschatological psalm. In the sense, eska, es, eschatos is the Greek word for the last, the end, Teological is our word, we talked about the word logos last week, a word about the end, right? It's pointing forward, anything eschatological looks forward toward the future, It looks forward, verse 9, toward the very end of the psalm, it says, he will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. So it it looks forward. At the time this psalm was written, their lives in Israel were probably not that great. We have a little trouble dating all the psalms, so we're not positive, but there's a really good chance that they sang this psalm in Babylon. They were captives they were slaves servants they'd been taken from home and they were under the authority of foreign empire ruling over them not always very gently very daniel that'll give you an idea things were not good and their word for salvation the hebrew what they're what they're talking about is is god making all things safe for them I don't think they were very safe in Babylon where, you know, kings were throwing people in furnaces. They're not safe there. But the expectation that they sang, because that's a song, psalm, they, they sang this, is that every corner, the ends of the earth, that his salvation, that every part of the earth would be safe. That they'd be saved from Babylon. That they'd be saved from hunger and poverty, maybe apathy and numbness, or just forgetting who we are because the lights are so bright and the ads are so good. When they sang joy to the world, they were not looking back, they were looking forward, knowing that they would be saved. And they long to see his salvation reach the ends of the earth, the corner, by the way, of every heart and every life. I want to do an experiment. What corners of your life? Because every part of your life is part of the ends of the earth. What, what parts of your life, what dark holes, back corners, do you long to see? God bring his salvation to. Vocation, work, right? What are some of those things? Maybe you, you feel like you're just trying to get by. I get that. I know what that's like. Maybe a little depression, just a sort of slight numbness to the world. You just wish it would go away. Maybe you want to push away. The longing for something better because it hurts too much to ache for that. I know what that's like too. And by the way, that's not a good thing for our souls when we begin to push away the longing for the world to be better than it is. What are some some areas in your own story, in your own life? Tell you what, let's let's shout out a word or two. I'm serious. I'm going to give you an opportunity. Just tell us something that means something, right? Addiction. I'll, mental health, that's mine. What are some areas you'd like to see God bring his salvation to? Feel free. We'll, we'll be a little Pentecostal for just a second. Self-worth. Loneliness. Anxiety. Hmm. Let me add depression to that. We all have them. Whether you heard yours, maybe you heard yours, maybe you just don't want to say it, either because you're like me, you know, you're not uncomfortable talking in church unless you're supposed to be, right? That's possible, that's okay. Or maybe you just don't want to say it out loud, that's okay too, but we have them. 
all those things, those are the ends of the earth. Your anxiety will go away. One day you will know how valuable you are. You will never be alone again. His salvation extends to every corner. The ends of the earth. Watts <laughs> doesn't look to the past while he's in his sick bed in a in, a, in another family's house, writing these psalms and poems and hymns and essays. He, he's not looking backward. He's looking forward. He finds joy in that promise. And God's promises are true. I know it seems so silly, but we need to say this. God's promises are for real. And there's joy in that too. Like, I know, I believe me, I know. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus came as a baby. I know it feels like a long time ago. And I know that sometimes when we ache and we wonder and we long and we cry out and we're like, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I mean, we've been saying that, we've been saying, the church, we have been saying this for 2,000 years. And sometimes I get it, that expectation and hopefulness and longing can begin to fade into doubt and wonder and uncertainty. I get it. 2,000 years ago, a little baby was born to a virgin, and he grew up and he was murdered on a cross between two criminals, and his friends scattered now, this man, in his life, he fulfilled something between, and scholars debate linguistics and all these technicalities, something between 300 and 500 Old Testament prophecies. This one man fulfilled. Now, some mathematician who understands stuff, and maybe somebody can explain this to me later, because I don't get it. I don't know math at all. What's 2 plus 2? I think it's 7. I don't know. But somebody once calculated that the probability of any one man fulfilling just 48, right, of those three to 500, just 48 prophecies, the likelihood, the probability was one, one in one followed by 157 zeros. I don't even know what that number is, but it's like more than a billion and a half for Google. Google's a real number, by the way. Yeah, It's a lot. It's way up there. I don't even know how to say it. That's a, a very much an improbability. Uh, it, it, unbelievable improbability that one person will fulfill just 48. He fulfilled minimum 300 for what that's worth. All right, keep that in mind. Now, it's been said since him that one day, every knee, will bow. Every tongue will confess. Every tongue in heaven and on earth, none of the earth. Everybody, all of us will, will cry out that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's been said that he will, his word, indeed make all things new. This one guy, he fulfilled at minimum 300 promises. Most of us can't say that. We have reason to believe that he will still fulfill the others that he's made. Three days after he was murdered, he got up and he ate with his friends. And this handful of friends who just a couple days before had scattered in fear and terror for their own lives, right? They began to tell this story, his story. And they changed the world. And by the way, this story that they told was not a story about power and wealth and fame and riches and might. It was a story about poverty, humili humiliation, humility, and death. And how these things that no one wants 
poverty, humility, death, how these things defeat the darkness in the world. That man, Jesus, who was born into poverty, who died in humility, once said that the rocks would praise his name. The psalm says the same thing. Verses 7 and 8 say, let the sea roar and all that fills it. The world and those who dwell in it, let the rivers clap their hands, let the hills sing for joy together, fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains, heaven and nature, sing. (laughs) Paul wrote in Romans that all of creation is groaning with longing and hope and expectation, the very same longing and desire that is in every one of our hearts. C.S. Lewis said, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in the world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. You and I, we all of us, have a longing, a desire, an aching for things to be set right. All of creation, the rocks and the hills and the floods and the plains, all of creation is crying out with the same ache, the same longing, the same desire that we have, that the king of creation would return and extend his salvation into every corner of our lives, Every corner of our hearts, let every heart prepare him room. We have that longing in us because he promised. And because you and I, we were made for a different world. We were made for this one. (laughs) But we wrecked it. And he's going to make another one for us. And that's what we long for, and that's what we want, and that's what redemption is. We have a king who's coming to make the world new, to restore all those heartbreaks, to make it what it was supposed to be in the first place. We don't, we don't sing for joy to a baby in the past. We sing for joy for a king in the future. And that's our hope. Only thing we've got to do, people ask me, well, what's the application? I'll give you an application. Isaac Watts gives it to us. Let every heart (laughs) prepare him room. Simple question, is there room? Is there room in the midst of our depression? In the midst of our sadness that the world is not what we wish it was in the midst of our self-focus in the midst of our decorations and our lights and our shopping is there room is there room in your heart to long for the king of creation to restore all things and to rebuild all of our shattered innocence and to run all the darkness out of our lives. Let me pray for us. Jesus, help us to make you, make prepare him room. God, we, we, we are. We, we tend to struggle with these things because we, we want the pain and the ache to go away, or, or, or we don't believe, or we doubt, or we question. God, I just, I just ask you to... Uh, be at work in us, in our lives, and in our, in our hearts, in our families, in our church community this season to, to, to make our hearts want, want more of you and nothing else. <laughs> it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. You have to stand for this. Yeah, I don't know if you can sit and sing with joy. I don't know if that works, but...